we talked about we talked about water bath, which is that it's a very stable way of heating a substance uh, where you have to gently heat it. We talked about a Bunsen burner, where you, if you want to strongly heat it, it has a temperature of around uh, 1000 degrees centigrade, uh, very strong heating, and uh, you need a crucible for that. As anyway, so so you've got uh, you've got electric heaters, and uh, if I want to sort of prevent, uh, how do I prevent heat loss in the reaction? How to prevent heat loss? So remember, a lot of heating experiments they have a lot of uh, issues with heat loss. So one thing you can do is you can uh, you can use a use a uh, an insulating jacket. Like if there is warm water and I want to keep it warm, right? So there would be some additional apparatus. How do I keep it warm? So the insulating jackets that could be used to uh, reduce heat loss. Uh, then there is, uh, you can use styrofoam cups. So instead of beaker, you can use styrofoam cups because uh, they are a very poor conductor of heat. So the heat will not be able to escape through a styrofoam cup. Uh, what are the ways I can reduce heat loss? I can put a lid on top. I can cover, cover the apparatus. So that heat is not lost from the top. So there's just some general general uh, ideas about uh, preventing heat loss. Uh, so if you want to, uh, some of the some of the apparatus that will be, uh, how do you handle hot apparatus? Use tongs. So tongs are used uh, to hold hot apparatus. Uh, you don't hold them directly. Uh, the uh, the next thing, other small uh, things. Uh, there's a glass stirrer, which is used to stir liquids, and it's usually made out of glass because it's glass doesn't really get hot, so it's a poor conductor. So you don't. Uh, so most of the stirring is done using a glass stirrer. Uh, you've got uh, spatula. Spatula is like a spoon. It's like a tiny spoon which is used to add solids like if i want to mix sugar in my tea i would add i would use a spoon the same thing if i want to add a salt to a beaker i'm going to use a spoon spatula is that thing um so other small stuff so that's that's about it uh, we'll move towards gas collection now and I'll, I'll just show you what a stirrer and a spatula look like uh, a spatula basically as a soap so that is what a spatula looks like. Uh, just a second. I so said that is what a spatula looks like. It's a, it's like a, it's like a normal spoon. They come in different sizes, uh, and that's about it. As so anyways, moving on. Uh, how do I collect gases? There are different ways of collecting gases. Uh, gases have certain issues with them. So probably the best way to collect a gas is uh, through a gas syringe. So number one, just use a gas syringe. The good thing about a gas syringe is that uh, uh, you can easily easily measure the volume. In an appropriate way, so you've got uh, So for so it's basically a typical gas syringe, and uh, so anyways, that's that's it. There's going to be a rubber bung that would be used to seal it off, and there's going to be a tube, and that's going to collect all the gases. So gas syringe, gas syringe is good for measurement. Any other ideas of collecting gases in the lab? Does anyone have any idea? What other ways, Amna, any idea? What other ways of collecting gases? Um, sir, upwards to the blue diamond system. Yeah, that's, that's one. Uh, 
So light gases, uh, they can be collected. Light gases lighter compared to air. So lighter than air. And air is 29, it's, it's got an MR of 29. So, because it's mostly nitrogen. So, so light gases will be collected using a method known as upper delivery because they always rise to the top. So you can trap them in a gas jar. So what you can do is uh, if there is a light gas and there's this tube and that tube has uh, gas particles coming out of it, then the gas particles will get trapped over here because light gases they always they always rise they they move upwards so that is how uh, light gases will be collected and then you've got uh, heavy gases heavy gases heavy compared to what heavy compared to air so heavy gases for heavy gases you have downward delivery So you're going to have downward delivery for those and uh, that's going to be exactly the inverted version of the same thing that uh, a gas will be coming in and you, you might will have a gas jar and uh, and the gas this is a gas uh, will because it's heavy it's going to fall at the bottom of the gas jar and you can collect it so gas particles would accumulate at the bottom and gas says the mr must be greater than uh, 29 for it to be heavy because it has to be heavier than air uh, over here the mr must be less than it's got to be less than 29 it has to be lighter than air so that is uh, light gases heavy gases examples of such gases would be for the light gas it's going to be h2 or you can have helium or you can have methane ch4 they're, they're all light gases and for heavy gases you can have uh, carbon dioxide you can have no2 etc right so those uh, are some of your heavy gases okay uh, is this clear this one yes sir i said now the third method uh, does anyone know any other method apart from this uh, for gas collection Okay, so you can collect them, collect gases over water. You can bubble them through water. I said, what's the what's wrong with uh, collecting gases through upward and downward delivery? You can't really measure the gas because remember gases are invisible, so you can't really tell by just looking at it because you won't be able to see anything over here in a in a in a tube. You can fill, you can see the space that they're filling, right? Over here, you'll have no idea how much gas is in the container because you won't be able to actually see. Uh, if there is gas inside it or not. So you can't, the drawback for this is you can't measure the gases or the volume of the gases. So you can't, you can't really measure the volume and uh, then over water or displacement of water. So basically in this case, uh, the gas will be coming in. And so the gas is coming in and um, all you have to do is put a beaker on top of it. And uh, there's going to be a trough of water. So there's going to be a trough of water and it will be full of water. And the gas would be bubbled through water or some other liquid, not necessarily water. And the gas will start displacing water. And there's going to be a pocket of uh, gas that will form at the top and you can measure the volume. Um, if there is readings over here, you can measure the volume as well. If there's an inverted measuring cylinder that's put over here, you can measure the amount of gas that's trapped over here. So the gas gets trapped over here. What's the, why is this not workable in some of the gases? Because they dissolve in water. Yeah, so some gases 
which are soluble in water, it's not going to work because the gas will dissolve. So not suitable for gases that dissolve in water. Harish, is this, is this clear or why is this clear? Yes, sir. So any gas that dissolves, uh, it's obviously not going to work because it's the gas will not get trapped. It will instead dissolve in water. And some of the gases that are very soluble are, uh, you should know that carbon dioxide is not very soluble. It's very slightly soluble. So it's probably not going to work. I mean, that is what your Coke and your Pepsi and your fizzy drinks are. It's carbon dioxide dissolved in water. So, so it's slightly, slightly soluble. Uh, you've got other gases like ammonia and uh, this one is ammonia. It's very soluble. If you don't know what ammonia is, you'll later on, you will know what ammonia is. Ammonia is a very pungent smelling sharp gas. Uh, there is another one, which is uh, hydrogen chloride as a gas that also dissolves. And that's also, that one is also very, 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 very soluble, right? So not going to work for soluble gases. Uh, insoluble gases like oxygen, etc. it will, it will work. So that's uh, all about collecting gases over water. So pretty much we're, we're done with we're done with most of the apparatus. We just the overview of those apparatuses and what they what they do. Uh, and let me just uh, yeah, pretty much we we went through most of them. We did go through burette and pipette, etc. Everything, TK. So we'll we'll now move towards. Uh, so we we'll now move towards mixtures. So can anyone define what a mixture is? Uh, sir, when two elements are mixed together, but not chemically. Yeah, do not two elements, two substances. It could be two compounds. It could be, um, so it's, well, a mixture is, when they're phys physically mixed together, not chemically, right? So mixture is two substances. So when two substances, right, they physically mix together. I said when two substances, they physically mix together. Uh, no chemical reaction happens. Harris, can you give me a, give me examples of mixtures? So give me one example of a mixture. So how is this not there? How many examples of a mixture? Um, is there a gunpowder? So do you get gunpowder? I'm, I'm assuming it's probably a mixture. It's, most things around you are mix, mixtures, right? Seawater, that's a mixture. Gunpowder, I guess that is a mixture. I'm not really sure about that. Uh, maybe it's just one substance, but seawater is definitely a mixture. Sand and water, that's a, that's a mixture. Uh, you've got uh, 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 sand and salt. Air. Air is a mixture, right? Uh, sand and salt is a mixture. So you've got, you've got different types of mixtures, right? Uh, I say, and, and although we're not, we're not going to study mixtures in a lot more detail, uh, we just study mixtures generally and separation generally. Uh, but there are all sorts of mixtures around you. Everything pretty much is a mixture, right? Uh, sometimes uh, mixtures are referred to, and this is something extra, which is why I'm not I'm not actually writing this down. Some mixtures are homogeneous. Homogeneous means that they are completely mixed together. Like if I talk about seawater, right? Sea and, uh, I mean, the water and the salt uh, have completely mixed together. Like, uh, similarly, if you if you have, uh, if, you're, if you're drinking tea, right? Tea is a homogeneous mixture. Like all the particles in the tea are completely mixed together. Like if I divide the tea into two parts, the particles in both parts would be evenly mixed out, right? Uh, and some mixtures are non-homogeneous, which means that they, uh, they're not completely mixed together. Like if I put sand in water, uh, sand is not going to be evenly distributed. It's not going to be completely mixed with water. Is that idea clear? 
Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And um, then you have further classifications. You've got uh, solutions. Solutions are uh, like air. What do you think air is? Air is a very homogeneous mixture. Like I, I breathe any part of air. Like I breathe air in Islamabad. I breathe air in uh, Lahore. They all, all the airs would be kind of exactly the same. They'll have the same proportion of uh, oxygen and nitrogen molecules, right? So air is an example of a homogeneous mixture. Uh, then you've got non-homogeneous mixtures. Then you've got in-betweens. Like if there's a um, sometimes, uh, like in solutions, colorless solutions, particles would be completely mixed together. Sometimes they wouldn't be mixed together. And there would be lots of in-betweens. But anyways, we're not going to go into a lot more detail other than this. So you've got, you've got mixtures and mixtures can be physically separated. They can all be physically separated. You don't have to uh, do a chemical reaction. When two substances, they mix together, they retain their properties. Uh, like if I mix uh, sand with water, Sand will still behave as sand. Water will still behave as water. Water will still have a boiling point of 100 degrees centigrade. It will still have the same physical and chemical properties. And sand will also have almost the same physical and chemical properties as well. So, so when mixing things, their properties don't change. Uh, they all have the unique properties intact. Uh, anyways, mixtures, they can be physically. So they can all be physically separated. So I'm going to I'm going to start with the first uh, type of mixtures, which is uh, which is if I have an insoluble solute and a solvent, and the example is sand and water. So that's the first one. So sand plus uh, what's how how do I separate them? What's the method called? Filtration. Because the first method is going to be filtration. So in filtration, you've got uh, you've got a filter paper which has these tiny holes through which uh, particles, uh, bigger particles, are not going to be able to pass through. So you've got a funnel, a separating funnel, and there's going to be a filter paper that's going to be placed uh, in the middle of it. And um, you're going to pour the sand plus water mixture from the top. What's going to stay in the filter paper? The sand. Okay. And, and the water would come out from the bottom, right? That's your sand at the top. What do you call this thing technically? Like the thing that stays in the filter paper and the thing that passes through the filter paper. What is the name that's given to them? The thing that stays in the filter paper is the residue, and the thing that passes through is a filtrate. Okay, so this one is the residue. And the thing that, that's passing through, that's your filtrate. Do you make sure you remember this. Uh, so this is just one example, but, but the residue and the filtrate part, that applies to all of them. Any other method apart from filtration that would work in this case? Uh, distillation, maybe. Well, it will work, but you don't need to sort of distill it. Um, hmm? See, there's another method which is uh, which is decanting. That's uh, so decanting is that uh, you allow the you allow the substance to settle down. I mean, over time, the sand if there's if there's muddy water, if there's uh, clay mixed in water. They don't really dissolve, but uh, the particles would be scattered around. So what you'll do is you'll allow the particles to, to settle down. So allow sand particles to settle down. And once they have settled down, what you can do after that is uh, just pour off the decanting literally means to pour off. So 
so all you got to do is uh, just tilt the liquid once all the sand is uh, at the bottom. And you're going to tilt it. And you're going to pour off the water from the top. Is that clear? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, so you just pour off the water from the top. Uh, so that is decanting. Um, next one, number two. Number two is uh, if you have uh, a soluble solute, plus a solvent, like your table salt. See, that's, a, that's an example of a, or seawater, that's an example of, that's an example of a soluble solute. So salt plus water. And with salt, I mean NaCl in this case, the normal table salt. So what's the what's the first method for this? Evaporation to dry nest. Because so what you can do is you can uh, do evaporation to dry nest. And what will happen is that uh, uh, you'll take a you'll take an evaporating dish. And you'll heat from the bottom. And eventually, the water would all evaporate. And you'll be left with, so the water evaporates and you'll be left with the salt in the dish. So the salt is And so why, and the salt is left behind. So all the salt particles are settled at the bottom. Why is this not a good way of separation? And what's wrong with this? Okay, evaporating to this. Why, why is it not a good way? Uh, the answer to that one it's is not pure. It's not pure, exactly. So impurities are not removed in this way. Uh, what will happen is that if, let's say there were all these salt particles, right? And maybe there was some sand particle as well. This black one is the sand particle, right? So if the water evaporates, uh, you'll have all the salt particles at the bottom, but the but the sand particles would still be with it, right? It's not going to be pure salt. So if you take seawater and you evaporate, uh, let's say, uh, the water, um, what we will have remaining in the beaker, in, in, in the in the evaporating dish would would not just be pure salt. It will have all the other things and all the other impurities as well. Is that clear? Harris, is this there? Amna, what is this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yes, second, sir. That's a second one. The second one is similar to this one, and that's uh, that's crystallization. So that one is crystallization. So what uh, what happens in crystallization is you do the same thing, exactly same thing. You do everything exactly the same, except for uh, you don't evaporate the whole thing. So this is what you do in. Uh, and let me draw a slightly bigger diagram for this. So this is what's going to happen, that you have water, right? And let's say you've got lots of water molecules and there are some salt particles that are dissolved in it. And there are some impurities as well, right? So let's say this black one is, in, is an impurity. Now these particles, these salt particles, these NaCl, the white NaCl, they're all dissolved in water. And there's, uh, there's lots of water molecules around. Now, the reason things dissolve is that uh, the particles, they get scattered in water. When you shake with uh, or dissolve any CL, when you're stirring it with a spoon, right? What you're basically doing is uh, you're scattering the particles, right? In water. And the particles, they get scattered far apart 
they become really far apart. The red ones are now completely scattered all over the, over the place, which is why stirring is important because when you stir it, that's that's why you the particles are getting scattered up. And this is an example of NaCl. If uh, NaCl dissolving, it's if I show you an image, it's uh, so maybe. And probably this one was good enough. So, so imagine your tiny. Maybe this one's a better one. Uh, just a second. So I guess this one. Imagine this as your tiny white salt crystal, right? And you start stirring it. So the particles, they kind of start getting scattered up in water and the water surrounds them, right? Now, all the water, now the reason the particles are not able to get back together is because there are lots of water molecules. The way I've shown it over here, the red ones are not able to join up. I mean, this red one is because it's not able to meet the other red ones, right? So there's a, there's a lot of uh, water molecules that are in between. Is this clear? Harish, is this clear? Urvash wave, is this clear? Yes, sir. So that's that's what yes, happens. I understand. Okay, so that's what happens when you dissolve sugar or when you dissolve uh, that's where the white crystal disappears. Tiny pieces, they just scatter in water. Now so now the other thing is what if I start evaporating the water? If I start getting rid of some of the water molecules? Uh, so I'm not going to evaporate it completely. So if I start getting rid of some of the water molecules, now there's going to be less water, right? So there's going to be there's going to be less water, and uh, I'm evaporating the water molecules. The red ones have a higher melting point; they're not going to evaporate. The salt doesn't evaporate. I said, now now do you think the red ones can meet each other? I mean, they're moving around in water, right? But now they're closer to each other, right? If I get rid of some of the other water molecules as well, the chances of the red ones increasing that would increase as well, right? So do you understand what's happening that you don't get rid of all the water, you evaporate some of it and allow the red particles to sort of meet each other. They would sort of float around, but now they would be able to meet each other because there are fewer water molecules. PVC, there were so many water molecules that they weren't able to find each other, but now they're able to find each other and they stick to each other and they would start forming these crystals, right? Should we clear it? Urba, Rafa, Amna, is it clear? Yes, sir. So that is basically crystallization. Crystallization, if I evaporate all the water at once, I will not allow because it needs time, because the particles are floating around, it needs time for it to sort of find the other particles, right? And crystals are always pure, because always the same type of particles, they attract each other. This black one over here, the impurity that was added, it's not going to join with them. It's not going to form a crystal with them, because crystals are formed from the same type of particles. Uh, and this is here, the same thing, crystallization. it's crystallizing. The particles are getting back together. But for them to join up, you need to get rid of some of the water molecules, that's it. So that is how crystals are formed. And crystals tend to be very, very pure. So that is crystallization. And you'll be very often asked about uh, describing the process of crystallization. In chemistry, that's that's very often asked to describe this. Uh, usually carries two or three marks. So the process is that the first part is you evaporate the solution to saturation point. which is basically the point or crystallization point that you remove enough water through evaporation that crystals would start to form. So evaporate the solution to crystallization point and then cool gradually. And you start to cool gradually and give it time. Um, once crystals are formed, then what you're going to do is filter out the crystals. So once this uh, red crystal is formed, this one over here, uh, you, you're just going to pick it up and you're going to filter it out. So once the crystals are formed, 
filter out crystals and I said, so filter out crystals and dry them using a filter paper. So that's it. So remember, remember this thing. This is very important because a lot of questions are going to ask you for this. Uh, to describe the process of uh, crystallization, and uh, every time you're going to you're going to write this evaporate the solution of crystallization point. That's the first part. Cool it gradually, allow the crystals to form. I mean, I can add that part. So allow crystals to form, and. Uh, once crystals are formed, you filter out crystals and dry them using filter paper. So remember this statement exactly. This is how you're going to you're going to write it. Is this clear? This one. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's crystallization. And uh, tell me a third method of uh, separating a salt from water. What's the third method? Anyone? Like the first two are kind of similar. That's they both require evaporation. That one is evaporation to dryness. And this one is crystallization. What's the third one? I'm not third one. Crystallization. Okay, so you got. Uh, so the third one is, and in the third one, we're looking for water. So uh, if I want to separate water from salt and water, uh, so if I want to separate the solvent. In the previous two, we were actually interested in the salt, but now we, if I want to separate the solvent instead. So that is when we do uh, distillation. Okay, that's uh, when we're going to do distillation and, uh, and distillation, uh, we'll cover distillation and other methods uh, in tomorrow's class then. Okay, we're running out of time. So this one would require time. Uh, so we're going to cover distillation. And uh, in distillation, you try to extract the water instead of the salt. And uh, there's another one, which is reverse osmosis. We'll, we'll do that as well. Okay. So let's uh, let's continue tomorrow then. Okay, sir. Sorry. And Amna, can you can start in like uh, five minutes? Um, okay, sir, same meeting link. Yes, yeah, same link. Okay, okay, same. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye, guys. Okay, bye.